So I think the biggest problem in the aging sector are getting entrepreneurs to really understand that from the vantage point of the older adult themselves. Um, and again, that's not all of them. You can't just be pejorative. You've got to do it sector by sector. So there are, I like to say there are curves through the aging sector. Some of them are just straight demography, right? So men and women are different or people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s are different. Uh, but there are other curves that run through it as well. Are they in an urban environment? Are they in a rural environment, etc.? Silver Adventures is a content and technology company dedicated to improving the lives of older adults through immersive virtual reality experiences. And this podcast is our opportunity to hear from industry experts, thought leaders, and passionate individuals to share with you their knowledge, expertise, and experiences. Welcome to the Age Care Enrichment Podcast. Hey there, how's it going? Welcome to the show. My name is Ash Deneef. I'm your host and navigator for our in-depth conversations about aged care. We've got an interesting episode today that focuses on products and services for older adults and how they get made. And guiding us through the wilds of entrepreneurship and product development is John Warner. John has been working in the aging space for over 25 years, and this most recent phase of his career has focused on helping new companies develop and launch their products for the over 65 market. Amongst many board engagements throughout the industry, John leads Silver Moonshots, a startup accelerator that helps prepare companies that serve older adults to get ready for investment and growth. I was really glad we got John on for this episode, and he helps to explain how all those new products you're seeing for over 65s get made, and what makes them successful, and how care providers could get early and discounted access with pilot programs. Before we get into it, I just wanted to cast out a net and say that we're planning our third season of the podcast now, which will start in 2022, and we're keeping an eye out for interesting topics and guests to feature. If there's a topic or guest that you're dying to hear from, then send us an email at acepodcast, that's A-C-E podcast, at silveradventures.com.au. And that's it. So here's our episode with John Warner. All right, John, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Nice to be here, Ash. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you. And just before we started recording, we were talking about the many different countries you've lived in. Sound like you've clocked over a decade in a bunch of different countries. Can you give us your travel itinerary for the last 30 years? Yeah, so boy, I'll go back further than that. My my father was in construction, so he used to drag me, you know, both around the UK where I was born, but then he started getting gigs overseas. So I lived in the Middle East for a while, um, in Jordan initially, and then in Saudi Arabia. But then since then, I've had my own travel itinerary. So I've actually lived in several other places. I did a bit of time in Singapore. I lived in Australia for 15 years. And I've been here in the States for the last 17. So those have all been places that I've lived for a reasonably extensive amounts of time. I think I've clocked 104 countries out of the 199 on the planet as well. So I'm pretty well traveled. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good effort. And uh, some of our listeners might know you from your work in the, the digital health or aging space. but was that always the case, the work you were doing was in that space? Not at all. I actually had a long corporate career when I was in the, the, the process industries mainly. I worked for an American company called Air Products and Chemicals for several years, and then I went on to work for Exxon. I was climbing that greasy pole for a number of years and mm. really didn't see anywhere to go and went off into the world of management consulting. And that's what got me to healthcare. At the time, it wasn't anything to do with healthcare. We were all about efficiency and effectiveness in organizations. And my first three clients were all healthcare. I worked for a biotech company, then a pharma company, and then a large hospital system. And the rest, as I say, is history because I've been pretty much in healthcare for the last 26 years now. And then slowly, I've started working with more startup oriented companies, certainly the last decade or so less large corporate systems and much more agile entities that are trying to be disruptive of healthcare, mm. which is much needed in the United States where we need a lot of change and we certainly need to reduce costs because we're at least twice, if not three times more expensive to render care in this country than anywhere else in the world. Wow. So, so what was it that kept you in the healthcare space then? It's a huge sector, multifaceted sector, and I think it's endlessly interesting in terms of how to render something as basic as good care is an extremely complex problem to solve. 
So I think it just represents a huge amount of challenge mm. um, at every level, particularly when you're trying to deploy any kind of innovation or technology um, to what is a very old system. I mean, in many ways, parts of healthcare have been rendered in pretty much the same way for 100 years. So it's very much in need of change. And so you have to balance that kind of old system that's slow and recalcitrant to change with a lot of modern opportunities to offer that change. Uh, that's the balance and that's what keeps me endlessly interested. Yeah, fantastic. And I guess something that you're involved with quite heavily, as you mentioned, they're startups and bringing new companies into a wider market. For our audience who are mainly working with the aged care industry, I thought it might be interesting to, to dive into the process through which new products arrive on the market, new services, and the different ways in which an idea can be developed and then be brought to the consumers. Could you run us through a basic overview of that and how your work fits in? Sure. Um, and that's a complex question because products are brought to market in a number of different ways. And, and the, the first way is almost accidentally in as much as products are developed often for much younger audiences mm. than older adults and then are either not adapted at all or adapted in minor ways for the older adult market, which of course creates a problem because your end user isn't necessarily the target that you were researching when you evolved the product in the first place. And this is true, the larger the company that gets, the more this is often true. And is it any wonder that those products don't necessarily do everything they can do? I think it's a little different in the startup world. Uh, I think, again, you can bifurcate that into two halves. You've got startups that uh, are run by people that either themselves are older adults or more often they're younger people that have got parents or grandparents that they can see have got unmet needs. And they often will be able to think of innovation or technology solutions that might help that situation. Um, and they'll bring that idea, hopefully, into some customer discovery at a wider level than you know, just their family members. So they can, uh, they can evolve it, maybe build a piece of software or build a device or whatever it might be that helps. Mm -hmm. My role in that process in general is, is a couple of fold. I, I run an accelerator that's entirely focused on the older adult marketplace. So thematically, we focus on the 50 plus population. And that's what Silver Moonshots, my organization, does. We bring six companies into a cohort every quarter that have the older adult market as a target and try and help them craft a solution that's going to work in the target segment they want to start with. So that's one way. And in fact, we're not the only accelerator that's around, whether it's you know in Australia or elsewhere in the world, you can join the accelerator. But we're one of the very few that has a mentor team that is deeply embedded in how the older adult marketplace works and in, indeed how different parts of that very big sector thinks and operates. I'm very much into ensuring you've done deep research, deep customer discovery in the older adult marketplace, because it's, it's not one big pejorative whole. We've got north of 60 million people who are 65 and older in the US, and that's, that's a giant population of people. And you can't say that market is one single marketplace any, any, any more than you can in the other markets. So, mm. so that's how we play the role with Silver Moon Shots. Yeah, that's great. So you know, take, for example, I have an idea that I'm going to develop a, a new wearable that's going to be exclusively for people over 65 and it's going to have health benefits, but it's also a lifestyle sort of product. How would it, what's the process of getting it from my bedroom, thinking of the idea to on the wrists of people out in the wider world? Yeah, I, I would say go back to customer discovery and let me just distinguish that for you. A lot of people think the next step is a bit of market research. The problem I have with that is that you start then with the product. So, you know, I can hold up a pen hmm. and so I've just invented a new pen. And as soon as I hold it up, especially close to the camera, I'm forcing you to focus on this product and tell me what you think about it. I, I think the first step is actually not to mention your product at all. Hmm. It's actually to discover the problem you're trying to solve for. So my question of you would be, Ash, if this is real, would be what problem you're trying to solve with your wearable? Mm. I mean, why even a wearable, right? Is it you're trying to monitor blood pressure? Is it that you're trying to uh, locate someone? Is it is it that they're lost and they want to be found? Is it they want to socialize in some way? Is it an anti-loneliness device? Mm. What is it that you're trying to solve before you've even mentioned the product? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that means you're going to find nuances in terms of how people feel 
think and identify the problem that might have a bearing in terms of what you then design in a design thinking sense. That might be a wearable, but it might not be. So rather than sort of a build it and they will come approach, which is like built this wearable, it's a nice watch that I wear on or a Fitbit or whatever it might be. Mm. You're going to spend quite a bit of money building that or at least building a prototype version of it. Maybe you're going to build a website to find that actually no one wants to wear your wearable. It just doesn't solve the problem that they've got. So I think the, the beginnings of the journey are get out and talk to as many older adults you can in the target sector where you want to focus this. Mm. So again, let me just illustrate you can't be pejorative about the older adult community. So would your wearable be worn by the older and frailer end of that continuum? You know, people say in their 80s as opposed to people in their 60s. Mm-hmm. Because, boy, those are completely different marketplaces. Funnily enough, the people in their 80s might be more willing to wear a wearable, but maybe on their wrist, not anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Maybe the younger end of that is prepared to wear something in another part of their body. So you need to be in that discovery mentality from the get-go. Right. I think to flip that around as well, for the consumer, for anybody who's going to be interested in the product, the problem that it's solving is the through line through everything here. And when they see the product, they'll be hopefully the messaging that they'll be receiving will be focused on the, the problem that it's going to solve, and then they can associate that with the problem it's solving. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think customer discovery does become market research because once you've determine that a, a particular kind of wearable is is the right way to deliver this solution, then you want lots of specific feedback in terms of how it's rendered and how big it is. I, I've actually been wearing the only FDA approved watch for monitor, monitoring uh, blood pressure, mm-hmm. which is a wristwatch. But it's the biggest wristwatch you've ever seen <laughs> um, because it's actually got a double cuff on it and the inner cuff actually inflates. So it becomes a mini cuff as if you were wearing it around your uh, your upper arm. Wow. So it's big, it's heavy, and they've had horrible sales on it. It's $500 worth of watch because people just think, oh, my God, I, I not only is it heavy on my arm, mm. but everyone thinks I've got a blood pressure watch on my arm, mm. which has got all sorts of issues just in terms of do I want to be seen with a giant watch which sends out a big signal like a flashing <laughs> light saying, this guy's got hypertension, yeah. watch out, you know? Easy to see in the aftermath, but customer discovery would have uncovered that way earlier if you'd have done the work properly. So I think you've got to do market research after you've done customer discovery. Right. So with Silver Moonshots, this is an accelerator that you're running. You said you have six companies per quarter. What's the sort of trajectory of the work you do with them? So we're inviting companies in that are usually bootstrapped rather than backed in any way by institutional capital. They might have had some angel backing. Can we, can we pause there, John, and translate those three terms, bootstrapped? Of course, of course. So bootstrapping is where an individual has self-funded this. And as you know, with startups, I mean, that can literally be, I've stuck it on my credit card and I have no plan to pay it back anytime soon. Mm or mum and dad's given me some money or some inheritance I might have got from Auntie Molly. But, you know, sometimes that can be extend to wider members of the family. They've got a bit of money on hip and they've given it to you. But essentially, you're working on your own capital Mm -hmm. or the family's capital. Uh, Angel backing is usually when you've gone to someone that isn't in the family and uh, they're an individual investor. So they're they're called non-institutional because they're not part of any formal regulated investment opportunity. It's like you going to a third party and saying, will you please give me $50,000? Here's my idea. I'm going to give it back to you, I promise. Mm-hmm. And that's, that. you know, something like 90% of all startups will be either bootstrapped or angel backed to begin with. Institutional capital is when you go out for venture capital, or in some cases, private equity or a family office. Um, and they've got a whole bunch of regulations around them just in terms of how investments are then made and how the startup has to treat that capital and report on that capital. So these are bigger companies, right, venture-backed? Typically, they're more mature when they get venture-backed. Our job as an accelerator is to help them get from bootstrapped or angel-backed to institutionally-backed, to help them grow up, as it were, Mm -hmm. be mature enough to attract investments. And usually that means a maturity in terms of the product, in terms of the management team, and in terms of a whole bunch of processes to acquire customers in particular that look mature. And therefore, it de-risks the startup uh, enough for uh, uh, someone in venture to go and say, this is a worthy bet that I'm willing to make with a million dollars or five million dollars or whatever the amount is, because institutional money is usually a lot more capital 
than a bootstrap company. Right. So it's, it's almost like you see the potential in an athlete, for example, you spend in the early stages, you spend time training them up and then somebody will come in at the later stage, to get them ready for the race. That's right. And I, therefore, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think we would see ourselves as mentors in the process. We run something of a curriculum. The very first accelerator, you might argue, was Y Combinator in the Bay Area. They run a very aggressive program that runs over three months or so. And some very famous companies like Airbnb, for example, have come out of that process. They were really the forerunner of all accelerator models. Now, I'm not comparing silver moonshots to that, but we run a sort of a, a version of that with a curriculum we take people through and that gets them doing, for example, customer discovery, that get, uses a template to say, is this the right team to take you forward? Do you have a value proposition crafted that's going to be compelling, et cetera? And then what we do at the end of six weeks, in our case, in the seventh week, they pitch to investors to go and see whether investors are interested in that as an investment. But if not, to give them feedback to go and say, well, in what ways are they still short of being investable? Uh, so that's, that's how we try and run this. Cool. I imagine you're probably getting a lot of applications from different companies. How are you prioritizing so the ones that you think are best to work with, is it based on the problem they're solving? Is it based on the team involved? Yeah, it's based on a bunch of things. It's, it's as long as they're solving a problem that's deemed to be worthy in the older adult space, they would automatically make the cut. So they have to be primarily solving for an older adult issue at large. Mm -hmm. But actually, the criteria for inclusion is more that they are already at MVP stage. They have at least two people on the team that they have a clear plan in terms of scaling the business. And they have um, put some bootstrap money into this, provably so. Then we'll take them further on that journey. So we don't make a judgment in terms of what they're working on. Mm -hmm. It tends to fall into either they're working on a healthcare issue or something else that older adults will find valuable, but we don't make a judgment in terms of, you know, how worthy that particular goal is. Mm. Um, in fact, we're more likely to judge it in terms of how much traction and potential is there mm -hmm. for them in, in terms of that startup in the future. That's part of getting investment as well. Right. Okay. So it's, it's a complex sort of uh, balance there of different things. Yeah. We have a formula. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, what do you see as the biggest problems in the aging space that, that we can address at the moment? Yeah, there are many and various, and just to be simplistic, they, they do fall into two sides. I, I think you've got to say health and healthcare is one of them because, you know, people as they get older clearly experience many more problems. At one level, it's just simple frailty, but then chronic conditions um, are in multiple buckets that people experience, simple disease states. In some cases, it's just living with uh, an ailment, um, arthritis being an example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a huge category all by itself. And you'll find a lot of innovation in the older adult space, maybe as much as 60% of it is health uh, and healthcare related in some way, shape or form, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's on the wellness side. So in other words, you know, it might be healthy eating or getting exercise and those sorts of things. Those are all in service of extending life and longevity and some of those things. So it still fits into the health bucket. And then the other category, the other side of this, the 40% is really everything else. And that can be just simple transportation. It could be curating better retail experiences. It might be in uh, entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how many TV shows are dedicated to older adults, for example, just to take one example of that. So there's a lot of people ideating and then innovating in that space as well. So to your point, what are the biggest challenges? I think it's understanding how older adults are experiencing the problem in front of them. So what is the health issue that I'm experiencing and what are the solutions available to help me mitigate that, you know, in some way, shape or form? Or if I am looking for, a, a, you know, a better transportation solution or a better entertainment solution, what are my needs mm. and what's out there today and what are the gaps? So I think the biggest problem in the aging sector are getting entrepreneurs to really understand that from the vantage point of the older adult themselves. Um, and again, that's not all of them. You can't just be pejorative. You've got to do it sector by sector. Mm. So there are, I like to say there are curves to the aging sector. Some of them are just straight demography, right? So men and women are different or people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s are different. 
Uh, but there are other curves that run through it as well. Are they in an urban environment? Are they in a rural environment, et cetera? So there are many ways to think about tribes or clusters of people that you can bracket together and then ideate around in terms of what are their needs um, in terms of you know how you might apply your entrepreneurship or your ideas generally. Yeah, that's really interesting to to really consider you know, there's, we're talking potentially a 30, 40 years here of life, but there is this tend to just say, well, everybody in that bracket is the same regardless of their lifestyle, regardless of their location or their interests. Are there resources that can help people, help entrepreneurs or, or anybody interested in this sort of work, help them differentiate between different subgroups of that age bracket? Or is it a case that you need to do your own market research all the time? It's a little bit of both. I think there are organizations increasingly now that are focusing on this. Some of them are straight commercial organizations. Mm -hmm. There's an organization in, in the US called Ageway, for example, it does research on different categories uh, of older adults. There's a network called Aging 2.0, which is also in Australia that you may know. Mm -hmm. It also does its own re research, publishes about what they call the grand challenges that face the older adult market. They also will go and look at subgroups. We publish some of our own research in shots also, just in terms of where those categories are. But I always think that's only a start. I think you have to supplement that by your own research because there, there's always lowest hanging fruit. So if you're evolving, I'm going to go back to your wearable ash again. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, where are you going to get your first hundred or your first thousand customers from? Because it's not going to be everyone. And you might say, well, it's females between 50 and 60 who live in urban areas in Australia that have uh, both kids to look after and parents themselves, which are getting old and frail. Mm -hmm. And my wearable is going to particularly help them more than any other category. So then I think you'd be doing your research in that category and saying, does that even that category subcluster in any way uh, to help you de-risk what you're then trying to do in that sector with your wearable? This episode is sponsored by Ending Loneliness Together. I just felt a sadness inside. I've never spoken to anyone about feeling lonely. I've never spoken to my, my family. I think I always try to show I'm well, especially to the kids. They'd never imagine that I felt lonely. Over 5 million Australians are lonely. While we all feel lonely from time to time, Longer periods of loneliness are damaging to our health and well-being. Ending Loneliness Together is a national Australian charity with the vision to halve chronic loneliness by 2030. We all have a role to play in ending loneliness. Consider making a donation, becoming a member, or sharing your story with others. Go to www.endingloneliness.com.au for more information. Hmm. Well, staying on the wearable example there and that demographic that you outlined there that it could be possible between 50 and 60 year old women, I'm not a woman and I'm not between 50 and 60. Do you think that having some sort of uh, personal experience, the demographic you're selling to is important or that can all just be covered with research? I think it can be covered by customer discovery and market research. I think when it comes to deployment, though, in the team, mm -hmm. particularly when you're looking to get investment in the long term, having people that are representative of that demographic on your team is critical. Mm. Uh, I've actually seen startups. Uh, I saw one team that had a group of half a dozen men who actually were out there trying to help uh, postmenopausal women without a single woman on the team <laughs> looking for institutional investment. Yeah. That's a really tough lift. Yeah. Um, they've done their research pretty well, but I think they needed representation consistently in the management team, just in terms of how they were crafting the products and how they were building out the product pipeline. I think the optics of it looked so much better, but it doesn't stop men researching women and women researching men. I think that's totally doable. Mm -hmm. So you must see some teams then that have quite diverse uh, makeup. Yeah. And some get it right out of the gate. You know, they think about who they're targeting and then, you know, whether it's in the team directly or it's advisory people, I think the smart ones actually go and get individuals that are representative of that first cohort there. They're trying to dominate because that's the game, right? And that first thousand customers in that cohort means you want lots of guidance. So, you know, you don't fall into a hole somewhere by getting it wrong. I mean, that's expensive when you make wrong decisions. So mm. Maybe there's an opportunity here and for older adults to be involved in, in 
startup process. And I know that there are co-design opportunities and there are places with life labs and that sort of thing where you can trial out your products and give feedback. But maybe there are opportunities in a longer sense as well that if you're the target audience, you're the target market, then you could have a role in helping develop the product in the long term. Absolutely. So I'll offer two comments to that. I mean, there are there's some fledgling places that are doing that. MIT has a lab for this. There's a, another organization called Thrive here in the US that is trying to deliberately involve older adults in the entrepreneurship process. I've seen some initiatives in Canada, for example. It's just not enough. It's a little bit fledgling. I think we could do it much more. We've tried to uh, promote the concept in in Aging 2.0 of the chief elder officer Mm -hmm. uh, as being, you know, in the C-suite somehow. I think that's had mixed results and hasn't always worked out. I I think there are cultural gaps and there are multi-generational sort of liaison issues that we haven't solved for. I actually think just as one idea, there's there's a huge gap, in my opinion, for individuals that have perhaps retired in a formal sense, Mm. but still have an appetite to work, even if it's just through volunteerism. I think if there were a platform that existed, which allowed individuals to volunteer their time and energy, perhaps for recompense, but certainly for the joy of it, I think it would go a long way fast. And I think we get a lot of older adults putting their hand up in the air and saying, I'm more than happy to be on the inside of that. So there you go, Ash, we we can birth a whole new startup right here. (laughs) Yeah, we're starting with the problem as well. We're not starting with the, we've got this great new app. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we could do discovery on that and see if I'm right. You know, that hypothesis that plenty of people will put their hand in the air. Let's see if that's true. And I think you do that in microcosm and then see if that could happen at scale. I, I could see it being almost like a recruitment platform. You know, you recruit the right type of older adult for your startup that gives you the best possible guidance would be what you would do. Um, I can see the monetization model. I can see how it would work. Mm. Going back to our, our wearable example, if, um, for example, I'm, I'm an older adult and I see that this new product has come up, this new wearable, is it fair to assume that, that I would only be seeing this product because it's received some money, it's received some backing from an investor, or is this a process that can happen at any stage of the funding journey? Yeah, if you mean if I saw it sort of at large, it probably does mean it's had some backing in some form in a more formal way. Hmm. The exception to that would be products sometimes get introduced on a pilot basis. And it's not a bad way for a startup to go, particularly if that pilot is paid. So you go to one customer, and this is particularly true when your model is is a business to business. Mm-hmm. So let's use institutional living, let's use a care home, you know, say assisted living, as we'd call it here. You might go to an assisted living with 100 people in that uh, care home and say, I would like to try my wearable on 20 of your people on a paid basis you know maybe we'll sort of rev share i'll give it you them at cost and we're going to monitor that over three months and just see what people do with them and the rest of it of course everyone's exposed to it the fact that 20 people have got it on their wrist if that's where it is or hanging as a pendant around their neck the other 80 are going to see it as well and in fact that pilot might extend a little bit further if it's a big organization it might say well let's try this in multiple locations so that would be where you might see it without much fiscal backing but generally speaking, yeah, you don't, don't see, tend to see products at scale until they've been through quite a few steps. I've seen plenty of products, by the way, that don't have much customer discovery behind them. Um, I mean, I think I mentioned the Omron watch last thing. That was Japanese funded. I think it was a hundred million dollar uh, investment in R&D. And I think they ran into problems later on because they hadn't done as much customer discovery. In other words, they constrained their market right. when they didn't have to. Had they done their customer discovery, I think they would have spent less money and would have gone further and faster. Well, to, to touch back on there, what you're talking about with, with pilots and at Silver Adventures, we, we run a number of different pilots. Home care is one that we're, we're experimenting with at the moment. And for people who are, you know, on the consumer side of things, pilots can be a way to get involved with a new product at a, at a cheaper rate, right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah, they're very good. I, I like pilots. I like them when they're paid because I think there are too many organizations that are willing to say yes to something because it's ostensibly free. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's actually got to be at least have some fiscal benefit to the startup uh, and to the organization in some way. And I think it makes it more real. But I think they're a wonderful way of testing what it is you're doing as a next stage after you've done your discovery. So you can tell I like doing discovery first because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. It's desktop research, right? And you and I can walk out and talk to the older adults we've got in mind without even showing them a product. So I like that to be the first step. But the second step is 
well, yeah, let's try and do a paid pilot if we can. Mm. Hey, John, this has been a, a really interesting conversation for me. We're almost out of time, but I wanted to maybe give you a chance. Is, is there somewhere you'd like to direct our listeners to, maybe something about Silver Moonshots? Yeah, so uh, you said before we uh, came on air that uh, I rant quite a lot in the LinkedIn environment. I'm uh, John without an H, uh, C Warner in LinkedIn. I have a, I always have a lot to say mm-hmm. about what's going on in healthcare. So that's probably as a social media platform, the best place. Silver Moonshots website is silvermoonshots.org. We are a nonprofit. So you can find what's going on in terms of that website there. And you'll find me in other social media platforms as well. I annoyingly turn up in many quarters. <laughs> oh, awesome. John, thank you so much for your time today. Very good. Thanks, Ash. Enjoyed it. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Age Care Enrichment Podcast, brought to you by Silver Adventures. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. And if you're enjoying it, please leave us a review. We'd really appreciate it. If you're interested in finding out how immersive virtual reality experiences can enrich the lives of older adults, visit the Silver Adventures website today at www.silver, that's S-I-L-V-R, adventures.com.au. See you next week.